You'd waited a long time for the power that only comes with one job in this country and you finally had it. Mm. How clearly did you know what you wanted to do with that power? Well, I'd say very clearly. I thought about it a long time and I'd thought about it really right from the period of the beginning of the government in 1983. That was, you see, Kerry, the reformation of the Australian economy was not a case of suboptimal consensus or even accelerated um, incrementalism. It was conceived radically. That was the, the opening up of the financial markets, the product markets and the labour market. The complete dismantling of the Deakin structure. You know, Alfred Deakin had the protection, the centralised wage fixing, what's been called the Australian settlement. The changes from 1983 onwards, which I superintended, were, were not designed to alter these things at the margin, but to change it radically. But as Prime Minister, I had another set of objectives. You see, I always thought Australia could be a great country, but it had to have a different idea of itself. That is, an efficient, competitive, open, cosmopolitan republic integrating itself with the Asian region. You see, I'd, I'd given the country a new economic engine, so what I wanted to do as Prime Minister was repoint the raft to the area of opportunity and our ultimate security, which was Asia. In other words, we found our prosperity in Asia and we found our security in Asia, not from Asia. You see, in the Anglosphile, Anglosphere leaders of Australia, the Menzies of this world, we were always looking for our security from Asia. I knew we could only get our security in Asia. Uh, so, and also we had the end of the Cold War, this great opening up opportunity for open regionalism and the rise of China. That's why I thought we had to be a republic. Uh, I thought we had to come to terms with our indigenes. We couldn't approach the region, the indigenes of others, like the Indonesians. Oh, by the way, we treat our indigenes pretty badly. You know, we're, 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 we're really just a, a European enclave and that's what we intend to remain. So, so that was the approach I, I took um, and that really governs the whole Prime Ministership. You didn't have time to dwell on the burdens of office because the wheels were already turning, so you had to meet uh, US President George Bush Senior. Mm. Your first foray into foreign affairs as Prime Minister and you had to yeah. sit down with the most powerful leader in the world. Yeah. How did you approach that meeting? Well, it was 10 days after I got the job, as you say. Well, I had of course met with my principal foreign policy advisor, who was then Ashton Calvert, members in the department like Alan Gingell, uh, other members in foreign affairs, just ruminating over things. But what, what drove me was my own view that I wasn't going to let a US president come here. He was coming for a golf game with Bob. That's what it was all about. And I thought, well, if I've got the US president here, I'm going to try and get something from him, for us, for Australia. And, and so the great, I used to talk about this amongst, in the office, that, that when the Cold War finished, and you re, you've got to remember that the Soviet Union was dissolved the week before I became Prime Minister. So this is all fresh. And I could see the big opportunity there and the Americans paying no heed. See, American policy in the Pacific, Kerry, was run by the US Navy. It was never run by the President or the State Department. It was run by the Navy since 1945. And so what I was seeking, I saw the opportunity of trying to get the President interested to, to bring the US into Asia, not through the Navy, but through the White House. How clearly did you uh, try to enunciate uh, your proposal for what became the, the APEC Leaders Forum? You see, APEC, the original APEC that Bob, Bob was the initiator of was a, an economic OECD. You show me your statistics and I'll show you mine, you know. 
I mean, it was immoral. It was an important forum. Import, it was important, but it had no real strategic power because it was attended by Treasury ministers and uh, trade ministers and foreign ministers. Right? The real power belongs to the heads of government. You know, it belongs to the presidents and the prime ministers, and that's where decisions get taken. So I wanted my proposal to George Bush was a head of government meeting in which he attended. And he gave it the veracity and strength and importance by actually and having the White House actually the staff of the White House actually focus on it. So, and so, for, but first things first, we had to see whether the constituency, which was the original APEC constituency, would come along. And that was complicated by the fact that we'd agreed to let Taiwan and Hong Kong as economies into the first body, and China wouldn't have a bar of them. So I knew I'd always have trouble with Li Peng. Uh, while ever Hong Kong and, and Taiwan were there, but it was too late to excise them. So my job was to try and drag the Chinese in with Hong Kong and Taiwan. So I saw the opportunity of trying to interest him in the idea. And of course, as you know, President George Herbert Bush said to me, if they see us coming, Paul, he said, they'll run a million miles. If you can get them in, we will support you. George was interested in it, and when he got up to go to the loo, and Brent Scrocroft said to me, uh, Prime Minister, he said, um, you've articulated a policy for the United States and the Pacific that we haven't articulated for ourselves. He says, that says something about us. It was a very honest statement. I said, well, thank you for the compliment. He said, well, let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. So. Um, the president came back and then the subject warmed up again and we gave it another go around. But basically it was left on the basis, this is potentially a good idea, but if you can get all the doubting states into the, into the basket, we will perhaps come along. You moved quickly to make Indonesia your first visit, why? Well, the, the sprawling archipelago to our north sort of governs Australia's strategic positioning none of the sea approaches to Australia can be had from the, the north or the west without coming through that archipelago. There's 230 million of them. I always took the view that Suharto was well disposed towards Australia, as he need not have been, and that we had only viewed Indonesia through the prism of Timor, particularly after the Ballybo Five had so influenced the debate here. So. I wanted, most Australian Prime Ministers had their first overseas visit to the White House. I wanted to break that tradition and make mine to make the point that I would regard, in, that I regarded Indonesia as a supremely important country and that I would go there. You see Kerry, in every strategic briefing an Australian Prime Minister had from foreign affairs uh, would all begin with a sentence, a paragraph said, the election of Suharto's new order government was the event of greatest strategic significance, positive strategic significance to Australia in the post-war years. Now this was true. Had it not been for Suharto managing Indonesia, we would have been spending 5% of GDP on defence, not 2 And we would have had all the time difficulties, strategic difficulties. But we would never acknowledge it. You were subsequently criticised for being too close to President Suharto, even subservient to him. Yeah. What informed the way you actually presented yourself to him, the way you treated him in your dialogue? Well, I always have, I like to think I, I had developed, a, a, the conversational protocols in Asia are very polite. This idea that we pride ourselves on frankly speaking, they don't frankly speak in Asia. They have regard for the other person opposite. You can be direct, you can, you can be frank in a, in a kind of um, well-tailored way, but not a rude way. That's what was the frankest you got with him? I had sharp moments with him over East Timor. One where he excused himself to go to the toilet, but where Mr Wadodo, his interpreter, said to me, I think the President's given you a signal that this, this discussion has gone to the point where he can't bear it any longer. 
You know, I took, I took within the limits of Javanese politeness, I took the whole Timor thing right up to him. Not that we ever got any credit from the East Timor lobby, of course. But I, at the same time, I was always determined that I would never let the relationship fall hostage to Timor. You know, and I, I took it on. So I gave, it turns out, Sahato as, as one of the leaders of the non-aligned movement in the Cold War, had been locked out of big discussions about the shape of the world. And when I got there talking about him being engaged in a potential development of, a, of an APEC leaders meeting and him being one of the central figures and yes, we might be able to pull the United States in and yes, we might be able to pull Japan and China in, all of a sudden his eyes lit up because he'd been sitting there just managing Indonesian problems for 30 years. All of a sudden he's getting engaged by the next door neighbour about the state of the world. What did you want to walk away from that meeting with? I wanted to walk away from the, of the notion that, that we could restart the relationship again around broader issues and not simply Timor. Bro a broader country to country relationship. And in the course of that, I had proposed to him uh, that we develop a ministerial council meeting so that the next set of meetings into the future wouldn't be just the president and the prime minister, but the foreign minister, the trade minister, the treasury minister. And he and I set up that ministerial council and to give Howden down a credit, they kept that going after I left and it still goes to this day. So 20 years later, the Indonesia Australia Ministerial Council meets annually. Yes. Did you actually feel you got close to him? I did. I think I got close to Sahato and he, um, well in the end Kerry, as you know, I got him to agree to the security treaty, the ANZUS worded security treaty between Australia and, and Indonesia, essentially between what was the leading country in the non-aligned movement and a member of the West, us. Uh, this was a huge leap for him. And I think had I not proposed it, it was my idea, it wasn't a foreign, foreign affairs department idea, it was my own idea. And had I not championed it to him and given him time to think about it, which was 18 months or so, and him coming back to it, I don't think we ever would have got that treaty from him, from them. So Sahado kept giving to Australia, kept giving, notwithstanding that the Sydney Morning Herald and the, and, the, and, the, and the Age and the Australian would belt him over the belly of 05 and East Timor. The fact is he had a very generous view of us and I wanted to capture while he had the power, while he had the power, I wanted to use his support to develop APEC. I couldn't have developed APEC without him. I couldn't have developed the leaders meeting without him. And without him, I had no chance of getting a security agreement. None. I wonder how easily you were able to dismiss the dark side of President Suharto in seeking to establish this relationship, in embracing him so personally. He had personally led a bloodbath against the Chinese communists in 1965, which which ended with the slaughter of more than half a million Chinese people, men, women and children. Mm, yeah. And he was notoriously corrupt at the expense of his people. How, how easy was it to well, dismiss those things or put them to one side? The thing is, but he was unambiguously the president of Indonesia. I mean, what do we do in Australia? Sit it out and say, oh, well, we'll, we'll we will just blot Australia, Indonesia out for 50 years? We blotted them out for 30 years then, virtually, to our own cost. Um, and at what stage do we accept the fact that the Indonesian people had supported this regime, and it had, and that he represented himself as their president and chief executive officer, which he was, what was I to do? The relationship we have today with this very important state, underneath it sits that core of goodwill I created with Sahato, and create, Sahato created with me. And frankly, without him, I would have had no chance of getting George Bush or Clinton into APEC, none. Without him, I wouldn't have got Miyazawa in Japan. Miyazawa, Prime Minister of Japan said, you get Sahato, I'll come with you. You get Sahato, I will come with you. So just 
outline how those events unfolded. You started with you started with Bush. Yeah. Uh, his message was, if you can start pulling these countries into shape, we'll 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 carry on. Pick it up. We'll pick it up. You then go to Sahardo so and you float the idea with him. I warm him up to the idea. He uh, then I told him I would see Prime Minister Miyazawa, and he was most interested in their response. And I was trying to get him to agree that in the event I was able to turn Miyazawa on, he would come in. But I told him I would have less chance of turning Mr Miyazawa's support towards my proposal other than being able to tell him that all things being equal, Sahara would come along with me. And you had developed some kind of a personal relationship with Miyazawa when you were finance minister. Yeah, he was the finance minister of Japan when I was treasurer. And occasionally I would have dinner with him in Washington of a night after IMF meetings. Very, very cultivated person, Miyazawa. So when I said to Miyazawa, if your inclination is to be in it, I will guarantee you Sahara will be in it. And what was your next step from there? Then, China? Then China was Li Peng. Li Peng. God, he was a tough guy, Li Peng. So uh, he, was, he wasn't going to have a bar of it because of Hong Kong and Taiwan. We then changed the whole acronym from the APEC Hogs Head of Government meeting to the APEC Leaders meeting. You could be a leader of an economy but not a head of government. And on that basis, I, I got the Chinese, but interestingly, at the dinner for that meeting, I'm still, Li Peng says to me, we won't be there. We won't be there. I said, listen, you'll be there. You'll be there. Because the Chinese leader not used to be spoken to like this. You know, I said, what, the US president's going to be there. The Prime Minister of Japan's going to be there. The Prime Minister of Japan, but you're not going to be there? I said, you'll be there. Anyway, his wife says, Mr Keating, please have some respect for my husband. He's just recuperating from a heart attack. So I got a rebuke from the wife. <laughs> How did you react to that? Well, I had to shut up. I had to tone down. I had to tone down. Anyway, my great friend, Jurongji, helped me behind the scenes and I got the Chinese. In fact, that was President Jiang Zemin, who I'd also seen. And of course, I had to introduce him to President Clinton in November of 1993 when we brought the first meeting off. But this was a this was a remarkable change, you know. I mean, a little gift from Australian foreign policy to the rest of the world, certainly the Asia-Pacific world. But without Sahado, I would have had no chance. You see, Sahado had imagination and scale, you know. Then uh, President Clinton gets elected uh, at the end of 92, so you then have to switch him on to APEC. You've got a new American president. Yeah. How did that go? Well, it didn't go well for a while because he said, look, I've won, I've won the election on this, the economy's stupid, and I've attacked George Herbert Bush for his war in Iraq. I can hardly then turn up a strategic body with you eight months later, you know. Why? He, he wanted Americans to concentrate at home on their economy and not be running off to do foreign policy exploits. So the deal I did with Bill Clinton was we would make APEC, the leaders meeting, look like an economic body, even though it was of its essence a strategic body. Because if you've got the President of the US and the President of China sitting there, and the President of J Prime Minister of Japan, it is of course a strategic body. So he said, well, what about this for an idea? We'll have our first meeting in Seattle, the home of Boeing and Microsoft, and we'll paint the picture that it's jobs, 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 and we're looking across the Pacific for trade. And we need a body to run the politics of the Pacific for trade and jobs. I said, Bill, if that's what you want to sell this, we're done. How did he strike you at a personal level? Oh, he, was, he was the most accomplished, uh, uh, he was the most accomplished uh, politician, political figure, vis-a-vis -vis the public that I've ever known. I mean, he's the most, you know, charming is not a word, an adjective you apply to most, most people, but he was so charming. And it wouldn't matter if you were the guy on the door and he shook your hand and he grabbed your hand with both hands and looked into your eyes. He had that thing about him, you know. But he was also called Slick Willie. Did you see any of the Slick Willie in him? 
Yeah, it was a terrific brain though, a terrific brain. Um, and um, he couldn't quite resist the intellectual opportunity of APEC, you know. I said, look, Bill, we're from a fraternal party. I'm doing all the legwork. I'm gifting this thing to you. You know, all you've got to do is be big enough to take the gift. Did you speak to him in those terms? Yeah, yeah sure, yeah, yeah. He loved that sort of political dirty talk. You know, he loved that political sort of dirty talk. And he, he came to see me, of course, uh, to the second, uh, well, we had, we had lunch at the second APEC meeting in Bogor in Indonesia. Three days after he lost the midterm election, the contract with America election to Newt Gingrich, and he arrived, his eyes were all bloodshot, and there was Stephanopoulos and Lake and all the other people there. And the, These were all his advisors. His, his advisors, and he said the real, the real point, one of his real points in coming to Indonesia, apart from the formality of the APEC meeting, was to see how I had beaten the Liberal Party, to see how we had pushed them to the right. What was the clue, how come the Australian Labor Party had stood on its feet for 11 years against a Conservative Party similar to their Republican Party? What were we doing wrong, he was saying. What were we doing wrong and you were doing right? You were running hard behind the scenes to establish a security relationship, a formal security agreement with Indonesia. Late in 95, in the shadow of an election, that came to pass. The, ne the negotiations were parallel to your push for APEC. How hard were they? Look, we had the ANZUS Treaty with the United States. The founding basis of our security agreement between the US and Australia is the ANZUS Treaty. The other state, great state, which is of material significance to Australia and governs its security environment is Indonesia. But we had no such arrangements with Indonesia. We had the five power defence agreement with Malaysia and Singapore and Britain and New Zealand and ourselves, but nothing with the great state to our north, Indonesia. So I wanted to put in place a formal structure of consultation uh, between us and a declaration of trust between us that Indonesia had no territorial designs on us and we had no territorial designs on Indonesia and that accordingly we could consider our position somewhat as one in the event we ran into adverse circumstances. And you wanted to see that as a treaty modelled pretty much on the lines of ANZUS? Pretty much on, in other words, of the standing of ANZUS in terms of, in terms, in terms of its, its language. Now, how tough a request was that of Suharto? How hard would it, be, would it have been for him to deliver that? Very side? hard. He had Why? to deliver the army. Fundamentally, he had to deliver the army to that. Um, he, he was a leader of the, one of the great leaders of the non-aligned movement during the Cold War. So every st instinct in him would have been not to do this, you see. But I had delivered to him and he to me such great benefits in the development of the APEC leaders meeting, in our general bilateral relationship, and someone like him towards the end of his political life I said to him, Mr President, you are the only Indonesian person who could deliver this kind of structure to yourself, your country and to Australia, you know. Uh, and in your passing, it'll never happen again. So why don't we seize the moment? We're never going to be attacking you. We have no designs on you, nor you us. So why don't we think about language which, which has a, a consultative mechanism uh, and a proactive quality that if anyone, any adverse circumstance does come, if you happen to be attacked or we were attacked, we have an active quality in the agreement where we consult one another. Now why did those negotiations have to be conducted in secret? If it had been come, no, it wouldn't have happened. Wouldn't have happened. So Harto needed time to get around all the forces in Indonesia to, to bring a thing like this off. And um, we thought after a while, he'd, he'd, he'd dropped it altogether. But at the Bali meeting I had with him, uh, ahead of the Osaka APEC meeting in, in Japan... In 95. In 95, he came back to it of his own volition. And he said, by the way, your proposal of a year or more ago, I've thought about it, and I think we can advance it. And one of my suggestions are that you nominate two people from your side, 
and we'll have two from ours and we'll try and flesh out the areas that we need to cover in such an agreement. And I nominated General Peter Gration and Alan Gingell from my office and he had similar nominations from his side. And the actual work then took place between the time of the Bali meeting and the APEC meeting uh, in um, Osaka. So there was a matter of months. A matter of months. And really at, on, on a side meeting of the APEC plenary session, President Sahato and I agreed substantially then that we would we would enter into a formal treaty arrangement between our two countries. Do you think that the value of that agreement was understood at the time by the Australian people? It was, importantly, it was, it was supported by John Howard and his then foreign policy spokesman Alexander Downer. I don't think the public might have understood it as, 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 as I, certainly as I understood it, or the government did, uh, but it was a great asset for Australia. And the great tragedy, of course, was in the, in the, in the fracas over Timor between John Howard and President Habibi, President Habibi of Indonesia, the president who followed President Sahara, abrogated the treaty. So uh, it's like us losing ANZUS. Looking back, do you think that your passion for repositioning Australia in terms of its international linkages gave John Howard the means to paint you as turning your back on old traditions of going too far in your embrace of Asia. Well, that's what he argued. He, he made the, in one of his headland speeches, he said, we're going back to, we're turning back to our European traditions, you know. That's what you would have expected someone who thought in the framework of the 50s and 60s to say and think. But he wouldn't have said that if he didn't think it was going to resonate with the public. Statecraft and nation building is about moving the country on. It's about taking the risks and moving the country on. I've always identified Indonesia, for instance, as the country of perhaps greater strategic significance to Australia. So, for instance, getting a bilateral arrangement there and an agreement there was central to our long-term security. Building that important piece of political architecture, the APEC leaders meeting, as another building block in our long-term security. Now, in Australia today, nobody would even dispute the fact that our orientation is moving towards Asia. But let's say I had been a lush. Let's say I'd have gone for the easy options. I kept waving the American flag and the British flag. And let's say the reorientation of Australia towards Asia hadn't occurred. Would I have done the country a service? That's the point. But th there was, I mean, our, our orientation was increasingly to uh, closer ties with uh, with Japan and China and uh, and the Southeast Asian countries that was happening anyway yeah, well, to a degree. Yeah, to a degree, but not the not the sort of the the macro political geopolitical positioning. There was, of course, a big iron ore trade with Tokyo, and we had a good relationship. Bob Hawke had a first-rate relationship with the then government of China, but the, the Chinese economy was then quite small. But Bob had been to Indonesia once in eight years. Once in eight years. The great state above us, once in eight years. I mean, uh, you know, Bob's, both Bob and Malcolm Fraser uh, before him had spent their great foreign policy effort in the British Commonwealth with apartheid. Now, apartheid was a, is a, it was a great issue, and Malcolm Fraser's case, Zimbabwe, were great issues, but Australia's vital interests were never in Africa. Australia's vital interests were here, where we live, in the region. And I wanted to declare those interests and recognise those interests and set up the political machinery for us to participate in those interests. And so the APEC leaders meeting, in Gareth's case, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the Defence and Security Dialogue, um, they've got Australia's name on the maker's label. You know, the security treaty with Indonesia, the, the perpetual bilateral ministerial council between Australia and Indonesia has Australia's name on the maker's label. So, you know, this is what leaders do. This is what leaders should do.